Good evening, everyone. Fernanda, and welcome to NAHD Cymru's non-selective Heston event for candidates standing for election in the Senedd within the Llanetli constituency. My name is Laura Tams, and I'm the organiser here at NAHD Cymru, and I'm pleased to welcome you all to this NAHD broadcast. I shall run through some brief housekeeping and then pass to Laura Dole, Director, to chair this evening's event. I'm pleased to confirm that this event is being translated into Welsh, so if you would like to listen in Welsh, then please click on the Welsh option at the bottom of your screen. We also have a British Sign Language interpreter with us this evening, so please spotlight to access. During this evening, Hustings, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions of Sanad candidates, and if you would like to ask a question, then please use the raise your hand function at the bottom of your screen. Alternatively, please use the chat function and these can be read out on your behalf. We are recording this evening's broadcast and this will be available on our website in the next day or so. We appreciate you sharing and commenting on events on social media and please use the hashtag NAHT can pledge. However, we would like to request that if posting photos of any of our digital broadcasts, you are mindful to not include comments from others which appear in the chat function and we thank you for your understanding. I now have the pleasure of handing the meeting over to our Chair for the evening, Laura Dole, Director for NAHT Cymru, who will undertake formal introductions. Laura. Thank you, Laura, and apologies for everybody listening that uh, there are two Lauras on the call this evening. Uh, first of all, can I just extend a, a warm welcome to everyone to this non-selective Hustings event. We are really pleased to welcome three of the Llanetli candidates here with us this evening. NAHT Cymru is the largest school leaders union in the UK and we pride ourselves on representing the views of our members in all our campaign and organising activity. Never before have we seen such a crucial time in education in Wales with curriculum reform, new legislation on ALN and of course COVID recovery. We need the new government to engage with the profession to work with school leaders, listen to them and put together an education system that will allow learners to flourish. To set out a little bit more about what NAHT wants to see from the next government, I'm very pleased to hand over to our Welsh President, Karina Hansen, who will say a few words before I introduce the candidates and we begin opening statements. Over to you, Karina. Oh, thank, thanks, Laura. And um, thank you to you, our candidates, for coming along this evening to listen to us and to answer some of our questions as well. Um, I hope you've had time to read our manifesto um, and I just want to um, uh, go over uh, some of the priorities that we hope you're going to support us with and promote over the coming year. Um, so I'm going to highlight some of the, the priorities that we believe are key. Um, first and foremost, well-being. And for us, well-being is key for our pupils, our staff and our school leaders. And we're asking you to put well-being at the heart of all policy making uh, moving forward to consider the impact of well-being and of policy before it's put in place. This year, last year has been an incredibly difficult one for our schools, uh, our communities. And while we're committed to supporting recovery, we want to have an acknowledgement that it's not just down to schools, but to a wider system to ensure that pupils and families are supported in that recovery. Uh, we believe that the well-being of staff and leaders has got to be a priority at this time. We consider that we are not able to support the recovery of our pupils and young people if the well-being of our staff is, is not right. It, you can't, as a, as a teacher or as a leader, be able to promote well, well-being if you're not in the right place yourself. And alongside this, we see a potential crisis in recruitment and retention of leaders if the support is not right in the first place. Um, and I think this is a, a big problem with the pressures that we've had over this last year. Our second key area is funding. Now, many of the priorities that we've got in our manifesto are interlinked and funding is, of course, a key area that's going to ensure the failure or the success of many of the changes taking place in education in Wales at this time. We believe that education must be a high priority for Welsh Government moving forward. We need to be able to adopt and embed a world leading curriculum. A curriculum that, if we get it right, will support Wales and its future workforce and economy. 
and we're calling on you to ensure a fair funding system um, is in place rather than the postcode lottery we've got currently got um, it's, it's not uh, there isn't we believe equality across Wales in terms of school funding our third key priority is accountability we're calling our Welsh Government to review the middle tier. Again, it's a priority that links to funding. We want to review the value for money and the impact of the consortium model. And while some regions we know are benefiting from uh, this model, it's certainly not the picture across Wales. And again, it brings up that issue of um, equity uh, within our schools in Wales. Um, we're also calling on you to support a break from Estin inspections. Schools were meant to have a break this last year to prepare for and develop their new curriculum and it's not happened. We've had to deal with a crisis of COVID instead. Um, so we want Welsh Government to ensure that schools have the time they need to um, drive the new curriculum without accountability measures that will, even if the aim is to support us, ultimately drive that school development instead. Um, and we also are questioning really how inspection can take place when the reformed curriculum is not there yet to be inspected and we're questioning how, how on earth can you inspect what we don't know ourselves yet. We feel very strongly that schools and school staff themselves need time to recover from this past year. We're not back to normal business yet, we're still dealing with the impact of an ongoing pandemic. Uh, the fourth key area for us is Curriculum 2022. Uh, COVID has had a huge impact on our ability to be able to plan and develop curriculum reform. Not only do we need time to consider the curriculum, its development, but now it's integrating recovery as well. And we need time to do this. It's not going to be a quick intervention for, for children and young people, but it's long term. And we need to consider evidence-based planning that's gonna support this curriculum for re reform uh, properly. And we're calling on you uh, to support our call to delay this implementation of the curriculum to allow schools the time they need to plan and uh, prepare for the change, to engage with our pupils, very important, and our school communities in our journey to ensure that the way forward is one that's right for the children and young people of Wales. And our final key area is ALN reform. Again, it's, 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 a, it's an enormous change for schools and COVID has hindered our ability to prepare for the change we've got ahead. Welsh Government need to recognise this substantial that we needed a substantial investment in training um, and support for schools. Alongside this, the key role of an Elenco is a very significant role and it's not, we believe, been considered in terms of the teachers' pay and conditions. It's a vital role that needs to be recognised and we could think that um, appropriate funding needs to be put in place to reflect the responsibilities of the new bill and that funding must be available to schools. Education reform in Wales is about ensuring that our children and young people are well prepared for the future. It's the foundation of the future of Wales. It's about ensuring prosperity and ability to sustain itself. And as such, we believe it should be at the forefront of policy making and investment. We've got a fantastic opportunity to make our education system world leading. And that in turn is going to support the future of Wales and, uh, Wales and its people. So we're looking to you to support the vision that we've got for Wales, to nurture a system in which uh, we can thrive, in which our schools can thrive, and that's uh, a way that they can deliver the support they need for their school communities and to value education as we move forward in Wales. We've got a dedicated and passionate workforce ready to take on this challenge of reform but we need commitment now from government to work alongside us, the profession, to drive this reform through with proper investment and sustained support. So I'm hoping you're going to sign up to our, um, our agenda, our, our priorities, um, and I'm thanking you now for, for listening to, uh, to, to what we have to say. Thank you.
Thank you, Karina, and thank you for uh, putting into words our manifesto so passionately. Uh, our manifesto is put together with the members of our NHT Cymru's Welsh Executive. Um, they reflect the views and vision of the profession across Wales. Um, thank you very much for taking the time to set the scene for this evening's event. The aim now is to allow candidates in the Llanelli to set out their views on the important issues that face schools and give us an insight into your vision for education. Each candidate can have around three minutes to introduce themselves before we begin to take questions from members of the public and NAHT members. Um, I'm going to uh, open up by asking uh, the Conservative candidate, uh, Stefan Rzewski, to start us off. Uh, Stefan, over to you. Okay, thank you, Lauren. Just check that you can all hear me okay. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah and I'd just also I'd like to pay tribute to um, you yourselves and teachers, learners, and school leaders for their continued work through what has been a very unpredictable year um, for our schools. Um, we as Welsh Conservatives, we have backed calls from uh, the NAHT for a fully and fairly funded education system in Wales. The NAHT argue that education in Wales continues to suffer from a funding crisis and call for a commitment to invest in the education workforce. Welsh Conservatives recognise these calls and have a plan to level up education by ending the underfunding of our schools and ensure that more money reaches the classroom. We have committed to 5,000 more teachers with more investment in Welsh education to provide more opportunities for young people and revive our education system. Welsh Labour has been in control of Wales' education system since the end of the 20th century, but still cannot deliver educational excellence for our children. Welsh, Conser Welsh Conservatives have a plan to help our children and young people recover from the impact of COVID-19 and will deliver, deliver for their futures. Uh, part of this plan includes seeing a number of teachers in Wales exceed levels last seen in 2002, when there were 38,000 teachers in schools. Currently in Wales, there are only 35,000. We will get more people into teacher training, which has dropped to 1,000 students in 2018-19 from nearly, from nearly 1,700 in 2010. We will use our retain, retrain and train plan to boost teacher numbers, helping to reduce class sizes and get Wales off the bottom of the UK league table of PISA standards. And one thing that has perhaps already been mentioned or touched upon, the number of registered school teachers has continued to decline year on year since 2010 with a 9.6% drop between 2010 and 2020. This is equivalent to a decline of over 3,000 teachers. And in that period of 2016 to 2020, Carmarthenshire, of which Llanelli resides, has lost 6.6% of its teaching workforce. The number of teachers able to speak Welsh has declined by 4% between 26 and 2020, equivalent to 488 staff. And one of the most important points is according to the Teacher Wellbeing Index 2020, 53% of teachers had considered leaving the profession due to mental health and wellbeing issues, emphasising the need to provide additional support for school staff, whilst the charity Education Support notes there is more mental health guidance available for educators in the workplace. They also point out that teacher stress levels have risen, gone from 62% in June 2020 to 84% in October 2020, highlighting the challenges that teachers are facing on top of their normal pressures. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Can I invite uh, Labour candidate Lee Waters to make his opening statement? Lee? Thanks very much, Lauren. Thanks for the opportunity to take part. And I'd just also like just to add my uh, acknowledgement and thanks to the huge effort that all of the teaching workforce has put into keeping the show on the road over the last year. It's been obviously extraordinary circumstances from keeping the hubs going to keeping in touch uh, with the young people and getting everybody back and dealing with all of the health and safety and the regulations, it has been enormously challenging, particularly on school leaders who are already under strain. You know, I'm a former school governor myself. I know I'm working very closely with uh, head teachers. What an exceptional job it is, and what a range of skills uh, that are needed, uh, and uh, what extraordinary uh, professionals you need to be to be a successful school leader. So. Uh, I just think that needs acknowledging. We have, as a society, lived through uh, an unprecedented time uh, and uh, we have taken for granted the, the fact that key workers have made the contribution that they have. And I just think, especially as we come to the end of a Senate term, uh, 
we need to uh, acknowledge that and also acknowledge the, the fact that you know we just people are going to need a rest people are going to need a pause people need their batteries recharged because the challenge before us is no greater than ever we have set on a, a i think a, a radical reforming program Kirsty williams as our education minister the full support of uh, our cabinet and ministerial team has been putting in place a series of ambitious reforms uh, from a new curriculum uh, to uh, an ALM bill, to a new initial teacher training regime, to a new uh, National Leadership Academy and an FE reform agenda as well. There's a huge amount of uh, changes being taking place and the next term is going to be about implementing that and that obviously has to be done through dialogue uh, and through co-production. One of our commitments in our manifesto is to work in social partnership, we have a social partnership bill and I think over the last year and I hope Laura would acknowledge we have worked extremely closely with all of the, the, the trade unions. It hasn't been an easy relationship uh, on, e on either side, but it has been a sincere uh, relationship where ministers and union officials have sat in rooms endlessly and thrashed it out and figured it out and come to a consensus. Uh, and I think that is uh, unusual in the UK. I think it's posed some problems to some of the trade unions who London head offices haven't always appreciated the nuances of, of devolution in a different setting. But I think through a genuine commitment to working together, we've got there. And I think uh, the, proof, the, the fruits of that are uh, clear to see. Our manifesto uh, commits to a number of things, uh, in particular, an additional 1,800 tutoring staff uh, to help uh, with the challenge ahead of us. Uh, and, and education remains a key part of Labour's philosophy and goals of social justice and changing society and increasing people's life chances. That's great. Thank you very much, Lee. And um, I, I would agree with the uh, robust conversations that have gone on with the Welsh Government over the last year and, and many of your colleagues, um, uh, some of which are not to be repeated in this forum, I can assure you. <laughs> um, I'd like to hand over now to uh, Plaid Cymru candidate Helen Mary Jones. Uh, thank you very much and I'm very grateful to you for organising this event. This has been such a peculiar campaign with face-to-face -face campaigning very limited and these kind of virtual events uh, have been really useful I think to all of us as candidates to enable us to uh, connect with potential voters. And I of course want to uh, associate myself with everything that Lee and Stefan have said about the amazing work that our schools and our school leaders have done this year. I don't think any of us ever imagined that this was what this was going to be like like and this crisis coming of course at a time of huge change which I know the profession supports around the curriculum as as we do as a party uh, we weren't ultimately able to vote for the legislation but we support all the principles because there were things we felt were missing but the, the, we support all the principles of the new curriculum and it does have that transformative potential um, I won't try and respond to every individual point in the manifesto because I, I hope that, that that will come out through questions. But I think in a kind of personal note, I just want to say that I speak to you as a qualified teacher, the daughter of a head teacher, and three of my seven brothers and sisters are teachers. So I get my ear bent regularly on these issues and also I'm, I'm able to have a perspective of what it's like in England in contrast to what it's like in Wales. And to say in principle that of course my party believes that making an investment in our children and young people's future is the single most important thing we can do for the future of our nation. Um, I'm happy to support the pledge. I found reading the manifesto and, and looking at the details really interesting and, and potentially challenging. We know we need to boost the workforce and in our manifesto Plaid is making a commitment to employ 4,500 extra teachers over the period of the term and to invest £690 million back into our schools. We know, don't we, that the research that was published in 2019 showing a 9% a, a cut in real terms in our education budgets and uh, that's not to blame anybody uh, and, and we can discuss why, how that's come about but it's not sustainable and it's particularly not sustainable at a time of major change. Uh, we want to boost the workforce, reduce class sizes and to support you as you lead the education recovery. I'd be particularly interested to talk to you more about well-being when it comes to school leaders. 
uh, because it can be a very difficult thing to do. If, you're, if you are the head, it can be very difficult to ask for help. Um, and, I, and it's never easy for anybody to ask for help with mental health and well-being, to be truthful. But I think when you're in a leadership position, there's so much pressure on you and we put pressure on ourselves to be strong. Um, and it's more difficult, I think, to get that peer-to-peer -peer support, which is often what does sustain any of us through difficult times. So I'd like to hear more about how that might work. Uh, your points about fair funding are, are well made and we, we would support those. The issues around accountability too, a, a review of that middle tier, you know, are, are all the levels of accountability actually contributing to a better experience for children and young people in our classrooms? Um, I don't think we know the answer to that, so we would, we would support the need to review that. And we also support the call for no statutory curriculum for the academic year 2021 to 2022. Uh, we need to get the introduction of the new curriculum right. It is such a huge change. The next government will need to talk to you as a profession about what needs to be done to empower teachers to deliver that change. You've all been trained to teach a very different sort of curriculum. I mean, one of the reasons why I'm not a teacher anymore was the impact of the introduction of the national curriculum back in the 1980s because that just felt like taking power away from teachers not empowering us to work with our students and I didn't want to be there anymore and headed off into youth and community work um, and we know the pressures that, that are on teachers now and bringing about this huge change uh, it needs to be done in such a way that it feels like an empowering experience to school staff and school leaders not and, you know the intention is absolutely that that's what it is it's to set our teachers free to teach and to, to upskill our students but if that's done in a rush and if that's done when you're being scrutinized in a way that isn't helpful there's a risk that it will fail and that we'll change things on the surface but that we won't actually change the substance and another big issue for us will be how we then measure the success of those pupils because we can't change to a skill-based curriculum and in the long term retain uh, an exam-based system which is basically about testing knowledge it's not about testing skills so again we would want to work with the profession to ensure that our evaluation systems match up to that new curriculum and that that is then communicated to our universities to employers so that they understand what we will be accrediting so again very grateful to you for organizing and uh, looking forward to responding to members and members of the public's questions and and it is really is a very welcome opportunity thank you very much thank you for your uh, thank you for your opening statement and thank you uh, to all candidates for agreeing to take part in uh, this evening's event uh, just to let everybody know that candidates have not been supplied with the question beforehand so this will be the first time uh, that they know the questions that we are going to ask them but i'm sure they uh, if they're familiar with our manifesto um all the questions are, are based around um our key principles and our key asks of the next welsh government I'm going to turn to the first question that we've had that has come through from uh, an NAHT Cymru member in Carmarthenshire. Uh, I'm going to ask this question first of all to uh, Labour candidate Lee Waters. So the same question will be asked to all candidates and we ask if you can keep your answers as concise as possible just so that we're able to, to, to get through as many questions in the hour that we've got with you. So the first question is, uh, bear with me one second. Following the financial crisis of 2010, the education sector experienced huge cutbacks, which has had a massive impact on staffing, provision and well-being. The lack of staff meant that nearly all schools had to cut small group interventions. The impact of COVID on the mental health and well-being of pupils is not a quick fix. This will need proper financial investment. Can you promise that education at the chalk face will be protected from future cuts in real terms as we move forward in the coming years? And that question is to Lee, first of all, please, Lee. There's no doubt that after over 10 years of austerity, the public services have been under huge strain. The Welsh Government's budget is largely dependent on the money that we receive from the UK Government, and the UK Government's funding has been uh, has been kept and that has had a real impact on all, on all public services and education has not been exempt from that. And that is not the situation we want to see. Uh, you know, we fought UK elections on a different platform but we didn't succeed so we have to deal with the reality of that. The budget for next year uh, is not, is very, very tough. The whole of the next Senate term is going to be 
financially very difficult. I think we've all just got to confront that and be honest uh, with uh, the teachers about how hard that is going to be. We have commitments in our manifestos to, as I said, 1,800 additional tutoring staff to continuing our uh, bold 21st century schools programme. We've spent nearly four billion pounds on that to date and we're pledging another billion and a half and you only have to look around the Himeki constituency to see the results of that. We've got new schools right across the area and when you visit them uh, you know it makes a palpable difference to the teaching and learning environment for, for everybody and that is a political choice we've made that is not something that the Conservative government in England has continued that is something that we've continued we're doing it in partnership with local authorities so they make a contribution to it uh, as well so that I think is a uh, significant uh, agenda showing our support for education that will uh, continue. We've also put investment into reducing the class sizes to around 23 and we want to uh, try and sustain that and we've been investing as well in the reforms that I said that earlier including the uh, national approach to professional learning which I think has been a really important reform agenda the creation of a national academy for educational uh, leadership. So we are absolutely committed to invest in education, but we mustn't pretend that there's going to be lots of easy money around to do all the things that we would really like to do. Thank you, Lee. Thank you for your response. Um, I ask the same question now to uh, Helen Mary Jones. Helen, would you like me to repeat the question, or are you okay? I, I, I made some notes, so I think I think I've got it. But if I if I miss it, perhaps you can intervene, Laura. Um, I was very struck by the point made in the question about the difficulty of providing small group interventions under current circumstances and we think that that's going to be absolutely crucial in enabling our children to recover. Um, Lee's right to say this is not going to be an easy time financially um, and before I repeat what I've already said about our spending commitments I do want to say that we've had our manifesto externally evaluated by independent economists and anything that we are making by the way of uh, spending commitments is deliverable because they would most certainly have told us if it, if it wasn't. As I've already said, we are committing to putting an extra 690 million pounds into school sectors over the, into the school sector over the five year term and we want to work with the sector to recruit and retain of course because retention is a huge issue uh, 4500 extra teachers and specialist support staff and one of the reasons for doing that is to enable some of that um, work in small groups work with individual students to take place to help them catch up as well as to make the implementation of the curriculum a really positive experience for everybody and something that goes beyond scratching the surface. So we will make that commitment. We will be investing in our schools. It is going to be a difficult time financially, but we have to make decisions. And, and it's right to say that this is a question of, of priorities. And if we don't invest, particularly in this generation who have had of, of pupils who have had such a difficult year, and that's everything from adolescent pupils missing out on academic education, but also missing out on their social interactions to little tiny ones who've missed whole years and have barely spent time with any adults other than their parents. Uh, we have to make this investment now that there, there isn't a choice. And if that means difficult decisions, it means difficult decisions, but we have to prioritize those children and in doing that that means prioritizing those of you who work with them and those of you who lead those who work with them. Thank you very much. Thanks Hannah Mary. And the same question to, to you Stefan. Yeah um, thanks Lauren. Uh, most of the sentiment that Hannah Mary gave there especially towards the end I, I, I would on, on the whole agree with that and um, Obviously, as Welsh considered, we've, as I said, my opening statement, we've committed to delivering 5,000 more teachers um, across Wales. Um, we've also would like to see the guarantee that more funding reaches the classroom, um, as well as increased school funding each and every year of the next uh, Welsh Parliament. Uh, one thing that we have seen as spending per pupil in England and Wales is similar at about £6,100 per pupil per year. Um, however, this could be considered as labour underfunding as our young people, as a devolution settlement means that public services in Wales should receive 20% more than in England. Um, what our pledge is that we would use the extra funding from the UK government to the Welsh budget and introduce a national school funding formula uh, to end the complexity of school funding in Wales, uh, as recommended by one of the recent reviews. Thank you. 
Thank you, Stefan. And I'd like to move on now to um, a related question um, that's coming from uh, one of our members in the audience, and this is around uh, head teacher pay. So I'm sure uh, you're all familiar with um, the negotiations that go on every year uh, around the school teachers paying conditions document in Wales uh, since uh, the pay was devolved to the Welsh Government three years ago. And there's a question here um, that is very specific to leadership pay. Um, if anybody is familiar with the last couple of years uh, settlement, you'll know that there has been a differentiated pay award um, when it comes to, to school leaders and teachers across Wales. And this has caused um, not only some bad feeling, but also um, does nothing to help the recruitment and retention crisis of school leaders. School leaders play a vital role. If the last year has, has shown us anything, it's how vital a role in the community, um, as well as the, the school, uh, school leaders play. So if I could just ask this question, and it's going to go to you, Helen Mary, first this time, if that's okay. So the question is, you mentioned that leaders are highly skilled professionals with a plethora of quality abilities. Currently, uh, upper pay scale three teacher with a leadership TLR in some schools uh, is a thousand, has a thousand pounds less than the head teacher. Can you have a commitment? Can we have a commitment, apologies. Can we have a commitment which values the work of leaders and what they continue to do for their schools? Helen Mary, can you answer that question? Yes, I can. I mean, what Clyde would want to use the devolved, uh, devolution of pay, teachers' paying conditions to the maximum extent to ensure that we appropriately reward all our teaching staff, and that includes leaders. Um, and I think we have to, uh, we would want to review that. I have been looking at my notes because I don't want to say anything for, that my that my uh, my uh, spokesperson Sean Guantian hasn't 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 red lighted. But it's certainly in principle. Um, we must reward leaders because the skills and the talents that our leaders and school leaders have are skills and talents that can be used in many other settings. And if we lose them and schools lose that stability, that's a real risk to the whole system. In the long term, Applied Cymru is interested in creating a national set of terms and conditions across the whole of the public sector in Wales so that we value leaders in different roles in the same, in the same way. Uh, because whereas, of course, our school leaders are teachers, but they're also that they also have some of the financial management and person management and all that, that can be read across the public sector. And in, in and, but we're not committing to doing that in the first this term because that is too much change for a very pressurised public sector to take at the moment. So it's an in principle yes from me, but I think we have to review to make sure that that's done on the fairest basis. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you for answering that question. And the same question now to Stefan. Yeah, um, thanks, Laura. And again, like Helen, I've been searching through my notes quickly now to see if I can see something that I'm going to perhaps say that shouldn't be said, but I can't see anything here. So, yeah, I think especially through the um, what's been highlighted through the pandemic, um, I think that our leaders, our school leaders, um, in, in principle, yes, I, I would get behind that as a, a pay rise for them, because I think it needs to be recognised of uh, the work and effort that they have gone to not just the leaders, but the teachers and well, and also the learners, but they obviously just go to school. So it's, um, but I think the leaders, um, especially with the stress and strain, as I referred to in my opening statement about um, the increase in um, the level of uh, stress, a lot of teachers have reported stress um, throughout, um, throughout all that three month period. So I think that if, the, if this can be a way that um, can be sort of our, as a, as a government paying back to those who have um, kept us going throughout this pandemic and allowed the key workers to kind of go into school and allow the hubs to open as Lee referred to, then yes, in principle, I would get behind that. Thank you, Stefan. And, and the same question, um, uh, finally to Lee, please. Yeah, so just, um, you know, we always try to be consensual. The whole point of the last stage is, is to look at the differences between the parties. So, so let me be partisan here for a second. You know, I, I, I can't just let Stefan get away with promising all this extra money when the Conservative government has been constraining the money and actively reducing the money as a result of austerity. So you can't have it both ways. You can't be part of a government that cuts and then come before an audience and promise more. The two things don't marry. So you need to be honest about that. Uh, you know, I would say, I think you know, leaders 
there isn't an exceptional school that doesn't have an exceptional leader. So, so, so leadership is key, and I think we recognise that by the creation of our national approach to professional learning and the establishment of our national academy for educational leadership. Uh, now, I'm not about to drive a coaching horses through the established and agreed peer review mechanisms, Laura. I'm not sure you'd expect me to. You know, we have a we have a process in place to do that methodically, and that's the right way to do it. So I'm not going to make any rash commitments here. I would go against that. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, clearly, I don't think head teachers do the job for the money. Uh, I think they do it because they have a, have a calling and a vocation for public service. That said, it's only right that that skill and that dedication is, is um, recognised. Uh, and we know that in a number of schools, we can't get people to, to be heads. And there is, you know, there is a leadership crisis in, in many schools, particularly in the Welsh media and education sector. Uh, so that has to be worked through by the next government. I do think that you know, sharing and federating has a, has a real role to play here and uh, professional learning communities is a, I think as a concept is absolutely bang on uh, and we need to sort of work together to roll those out and make them meaningful and I think you know the concept of, uh, of rewarding and nurturing exceptional leaders and perhaps using them over, over a number of schools uh, rather than just one as an executive leadership role I, th I think has a lot of merit in it and that may be one way uh, that we can develop the, the point that the questioner addressed. Thank you, Lee, and thank you to all candidates for uh, for asking that question, uh, for answering that question. Uh, the question is from uh, one of our members in Carmarthenshire, so thank you to that member for putting the question forward. Um, a related question, I think that we've all kind of you've all kind of touched upon um, in giving various answers, is around uh, our call for a review of the middle tier. So we know that um, the middle tier operates. Um, successfully maybe in some areas more than in others and I think we are, our position on uh, the middle tier is clear. Uh, we have a concern that the money that comes into uh, the education system uh, should be put on the front line and we have serious reservations about the uh, significant amount of money that is uh, skimmed off the top of, the, uh, of school funding to support um, the middle tier. The middle tier, uh, when it was first thought about, was to drive school improvement um, and to go hand in hand with local government reform. Uh, unfortunately, we, we seem to have not had the local government reform, but we have the middle tier. So now we have this extra uh, layer um, that, uh, in our view, uh, is taking a lot of money away from frontline schooling. Uh, we'd like to ask all candidates, um, what is your view of the middle tier? And would you support uh, NAHD Camry call to review the middle tier and that question goes to Stefan first of all please. Yeah um, thanks and yet yeah, Welsh considers we'd recognise the um, arguments about the lack of clarity about the role that regional consortia that play in school improvement um, to improve the accountability and accessibility of the so-called middle tier of education uh, we, we as Welsh Conservatives have um, committed to establishing a new regional education advisory services to consolidate the different functions of existing consortia, including things like school transport, school standards, and teacher recruitment and working conditions, including supply teacher employment. So we do recognise um, your your sort of uh, your arguments there, and I think that is one that um, I'm hoping that the other candidates will join me in as well. Thank you, Stefan. And that question uh, next to Lee, please, Lee. Well, I think the consortia are a mixed bag. Um, and I think that's one of the issues, really, is the consistency of the added value that they bring to the party. Uh, so I, I, you know, I don't think we should, to mix my metaphors, because I am a politician after all, I, I don't think we should throw the baby out uh, with the bathwater. It makes no sense to me to have 22 separate arrangements for channel, uh, channel advisors. Uh, and the other functions that they carry out. Uh, we do have a, a local government reform agenda, which is significantly advanced. We've passed the legislation to create corporate point committees, possibly the worst name we could have come up with, uh, which uh, come into effect. I'm so sorry, uh, thanks for interruption. I'm just having a little problem hearing Lee at the moment. Um, could you speak up, please? Thank you. Apologies, I've got some hay fever, maybe getting in the way. Uh, 
Yeah, so, yeah, so corporate job committees are, are coming in. These are effectively going to be large county councils in, in all but name. Over, over some facilities, they will act as large regional authorities. Uh, and I think we need to look at the alignment of the consortium next to those. You need to look at the fit for them. I think, you know, I think your review is sensible because they've been going a while and now the landscape is changing. But I, I, I think the principle of, of collaborating with the regional footprint is the right one. Uh, but I think getting the implementation right is, a, is an evolving journey. Thank you, Lee. And the same question to Helen Mary. Well, the, the short answer is yes, we would want to support that call for a review. It's, it's, it's in our manifesto. Uh, there is so much complexity around decision making and it's very difficult to see what the lines of accountability are. Some of what Leah has said may assist with that, um, but that still doesn't get us to the bottom of why some of the consortia seem to have worked effectively and some of them clearly, to be honest, haven't. Um, so we need to review this, we need to review that and we also need to review, you know, how the role of ESTIN fits into all of that, the WJEC qualification, all the, all the different bodies that we've got. Uh, that are between, if you like, Welsh Government and the chalk face need to be reviewed and we need to be making sure that any money that we're spending on them is actually, you can trace that directly into improving the classroom experience and in supporting people who are actually delivering education. And if any of it isn't doing that, then it needs to change and go. Uh, and that's part of our commitment to streamlining and reducing the amount of administration and bureaucracy that teaching staff have to do. Uh, you can't get away from some of it. There has to be some, some transparency, some accountability, um, but we need to reduce that so that we can focus teachers' time where teachers need and want to be, which is with their pupils or preparing to be with their pupils uh, and not on, making responding to accountability requests where it isn't really clear what's done with that information and whether that makes any difference so it's absolutely an absolute yes to a review um and to make sure that the arrangements work for pupils and for staff thank you for that thank you very much for coming back in on that on that question a uh, question that's been posed in the in the chat function um i'm going to paraphrase a little bit and add a little bit to it because it kind of combines another question that we've already received uh, so this question is going to uh, Lee first of all. So it's around um, expectations on schools and responsibilities. So do you think that schools are being expected to take on too many responsibilities from other agencies such as health and social care? Uh, the question uh, in the chat goes on to say that we're now responsible for teeth brushing, hosting medical interventions such as flu jabs, basic checks, speech and language monitoring, uh, monitoring of COVID cases, etc. And this is on top of uh, the uh, building and grounds maintenance, finance, etc. Uh, schools should be allowed to focus on education, teaching and learning. And in, and in that question, um, I'd like to add in um, a little bit around the whole school approach to mental health and wellbeing. So this is an initiative that's come up at the moment, something that we are fully supportive of at NAHD and our members uh, understand the reasons why and the principles why uh, this is so uh, important. Indeed, it features in our manifesto. We understand and recognise the importance of the mental health and wellbeing of the whole school family. However, its current form talks around the responsibilities of head teachers to support everybody within the mechanism so that's supporting learners to support staff etc there isn't a lot of support available for school leaders themselves so we know that governing bodies have the responsibility have a, have a duty towards school leaders but even within um this key uh piece of legislative framework that's coming through um there there is really no mention of that support so i suppose a question is it is in two parts one do you think there are too many responsibilities being placed on school leaders from other agencies? And then a kind of a part B to that, um, is there enough support uh, for school leaders themselves? And, and how would you as a candidate look to look to develop that? I'm, I'm going to give it to Lee first of all. Apologies, Lee, that was a bit of a ramble of a question. Hopefully you get the gist of you get the gist of where I'm coming from with this. Well, let me answer in reverse order then, because I think you're absolutely right, Laura. Then you know, uh, we need to support our teachers. And I support what Helen Mary said earlier about that, about the mental well-being of school leaders. It's an incredibly pressure job, it's an incredibly lonely job. Uh, and, you know, that's that uh, nurturing 
uh, environment needs to be there. Uh, so I think that is you know, that is something we need to keep talking about and keep working on. Um, and I think professional learning communities again have a role to play here in peer support uh, and in providing a way a sort of a framework, if you like, so that additional support might be provided. Um, but I think the whole school approach to mental health has got to include school leaders and and all all staff, people, and non teachers. Um, so on the first part, are we asking too much of schools? Well, you know, there is always a tension, isn't there? Because all sorts of agencies that want to reach families find schools the easiest, the most effective way to, to get at them. And that then puts a big ask on schools. Um, but, you know, you mentioned toothbrushing as an example, and you mentioned uh, COVID as another example. You know, I think, you know, the exceptional school leaders I've come across recognise their role is not just about narrow education. It is about the whole family experience. It is about a holistic approach. Uh, and they look for opportunities to involve food schemes and uh, outreach to families to get parents who might have had a bad experience at school themselves uh, to to do some learning alongside their children, recognizing that without that, you're not going to reach the children uh, who uh, don't have advantages at home. So, so I think it's a lot. It's a big ask for sure, but I think it's a I think it's a reasonable ask. Uh, so long as we put the support in place, what is not reasonable to do is to say to the head teacher, you're going to do all those things without framework of support to help you do that. That is not reasonable. Um, but I think you know we need to see schools, you know, it, the community focused schools as just more than about letting up the netball courts. If your schools are genuinely community focused, they need to look at the whole needs of the child and the family to nurture them uh, and not just uh, uh, you know, a more narrow definition of, of, of teaching and learning. Thank you, Lee. Uh, the same question to uh, Stefan next, please. Stefan? Yeah, sorry, Laura. Um, the first bit, I kind of, I missed the first bit of the question. Is it regarding about taking on too much respons responsibilities? Is that the yeah. essence of this? Yes, basically, there's a there's a question that's been posed in the chat function around um, additional responsibilities. And do you feel that schools take on a lot of uh, responsibilities that may have traditionally been uh, from health or, or, or other sectors and has now been consumed within the role of, of school leaders and schools? And then um, the second part was around um, mental health and well-being support and the current whole, whole school approach to mental health and well-being that focuses on support for everyone else but doesn't seem to have that much detail on support for school leaders a responsibility um, that resides with uh, the local authority as the employer and the governing body so kind of your comments your thoughts on yes those, and please. as you said that the, the two kind of go hand in hand in this um really um with, with regards to the um taking on too much responsibilities i think um and I, as I'm not from the profession, I've not got any links to the profession, so I'm speaking on a personal capacity here. Um, I wouldn't say I disagree, but I think COVID has highlighted the amount teachers have had to do um, and leaders have had to do throughout um, the pandemic, whether it's realised about blended learning or just classroom learning or online learning. So it's all things like that um, have to be considered with it as well. Um, and I. And I do have seen that, that it also comes back to the previous question that was asked as well about if our teachers and especially our leaders are remunerated appropriately, then to the, the mental health well being the stress of that, where as I think a point that Helen made in an opening statement about leaders perhaps not having that peer to peer um, advice or appropriate um, setting for them to go to one of their peers because of the nature of their role, um, that their mental health perhaps isn't in some instances taken into into consideration so yeah um we as well as considered would uh, we do welcome the calls for a new focus on mental health and well-being of school leaders um, we are clear that mental health and well-being is one of our priorities if um, we are elected to government uh, particularly reflecting the impact that the COVID-19 pandemic as I touched on sat on teachers school leaders and learners um, you also we also share the priority with yourself the NAHT further but the need for a whole school approach to mental health, ensuring that well-being is a shared priority amongst all like the local authority, governors and um, colleagues within schools as well. Thank you, 
you, Stefan. And uh, lastly, to you, Hannah Mary, please. Thank you. If I can start with the uh, well-being of school leaders point, first of all. Um, I think, Mike, I'd almost put the question back to you and, and say, you tell us what you need and let's work out how you can best be provided with that. Uh, because I think the kind of support that a leader needs for their mental health and well-being may be different from what frontline staff would would require and i think we've all acknowledged what incredible stressful job it can be i mean i think one of the things that must be done is to, is to build in time to allow school leaders to pay attention to their own health and well-being i mean that's one of the risks is that the best leaders are always thinking about everybody else uh, and they don't get around to think of for themselves and in that way it's a bit like being a parent if you're if you're not well yourself you can't look after your children and, and if you're not feeling in a good place as a leader you can't look after your 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 staff your pupils i mean one of the ideas that i would think it would might be worth consideration is of course that throughout the social work profession everybody has to have a supervisor who's external and when it gets to a leadership level that supervisor is external to their organization and they have regular timetabled meetings with that person to whom they can take professional concerns on a confidential basis but who they can also take personal concerns and and, and distress if there is any and that might be some that might be it might be worth looking at how senior staff in social services get that supervision because that might be one model uh, that could be looked at and, and i think you know the next welsh government will have to make that a clear requirement of local authorities who are your employers that that's essential to so come back to the question about whether schools are being asked to do too much and the question said something about um schools being about teaching and learning well i suppose from my perspective and i don't think this is any different because I, I remember you know when my father was a head teacher in the 1960s the school was open at eight o'clock in the morning because lots of the parents worked uh, and teachers came in on a voluntary basis to do, to do that well teachers teachers have always done more than teach and schools have always done more than ed, simply educate and you know we all know don't we that if children are distressed or if they're tired or if they're hungry they can't learn. So schools have obviously got a role in that well-being of children and young people. But the question is, how do you make that happen? And so we would want, for example, to employ more non-teaching staff within schools. I'm aware of some very successful uh, projects where, where they've had youth work staff in school, for example, who can help deal with some of the social uh, issues and some of the social developmental needs of children so that teachers don't have to do all of that. Um, and we would want to work out with school leaders, well, what does this sort of community-based school look like? What, what resources do you need in that school to provide for the social needs of the children as well as for their academic needs? Uh, most teachers will still want to play a role in that, but they need to have other sort of staff with them to support that. Um, I think, though, I'd have to say that in the end, you, you sort of can't take that away from the school leader, because even if you've bought into that school, social workers, more nursery nurse staff, qualified staff for little ones, you know, whoever else you bring in, uh, the, the school leader is still going to have to be the one who's who's overseeing all of that. So some of that is about, for me, is about making sure that school leaders are empowered to do that, that they have authority within their own schools when they're working with staff from other organisations, and to come back again to my point about well-being, that they have time to take care of their own mental health and well-being needs to make sure that they can provide that complex leadership uh, that, that our 21st century schools will need, well, that our 21st century pupils need. Thank you very much. And I'm going to try, um, hopefully successfully, to uh, incorporate kind of two uh, last questions in one, just because I'm conscious that we're running out of time. So we've all spoken about the impact of COVID and we've all spoken about um, the profession's um, appetite for curriculum reform. You know, we all recognise and support that that's something that's needed, that's wanted, and NAHT um, has worked with uh, the Welsh Government in the development of that new curriculum. I suppose our question is at the moment, um, and this is a question that's been posed by many of our members, is around timing. So we're looking at the moment um, at COVID recovery that absolutely has to be uh, the priority uh, for school leaders and I don't think anybody would disagree with that. However, we are away and members are anxious that uh, the curriculum reform agenda uh, is looming, uh, an inspection free year that they were promised 
um, hasn't happened because COVID took over and everybody went into uh, crisis management mode. Schools were repurposed uh, from uh, schools to hubs up between a Friday and a Monday and anything else had to take uh, a back seat. So my question is to, to each of the candidates, um, do you support our call for a pause on the rollout of the new curriculum? And do you support our call for uh, Essen inspections to be put off for another year? Um, not only because we feel that schools are not in a place at the moment to have that additional pressure, but also the question of whether Eston, uh, who were also supposed to have a, a year off uh, to develop those new inspection arrangements, have obviously been busy with other things um, as well. So it's whether or not everybody is ready for that. And I suppose uh, my question is those two in two parts. And first of all, to uh, Helen Mary, please. Uh, thank you. And, and the simple answer to that is, is yes to both. Uh, the new curriculum is, has got such potential, it's so exciting, but it has got to, to be got right. And none of us saw COVID coming, none of us saw the impact of, of, that that would have on our pupils and on our, on our school professionals. So we do support the call for a, um, a curriculum free year, as it were, to, in, to introduce, to give time for the curriculum to be introduced properly. I think there's more work to be done with the profession to, for us to understand better what you need to enable you to deliver that curriculum, what new, tra what new training might you need, what, what do we need to do to initial teacher training to get that fit for purpose, and likewise with the inspection for a year. I mean, I'm very far from convinced that Estin is in the right place yet to inspect the new curriculum. Um, so they need some time, I think, to adjust their methods and to make sure that their staff are trained and ready to inspect the delivery of the new curriculum. And so I think if from both sides, that, that pause, that breathing space is necessary. Um, I have heard some people say, oh, is, is this about kicking, kicking change into the long grass? Well, for me, no, it isn't. It's about making sure that that change is delivered effectively and in a way that takes into account the huge pressures that COVID has put on the system and, and on the people working in the system. Um, I'm still absolutely convinced we can get this right and that that will be a high priority for whoever forms the next Welsh Government. It will certainly be a high priority for Plaid if it's us. But that bit of a pause, bit of a breathing space to enable it to be done right, uh, we think is in, entirely sensible. Thank you very much. And that same question to you, please, Stefan. Yeah, um, and again, in short, um, yes to both. Um, I, so as, as we as Welsh Conservatives uh, agree that, that as the, once the pandemic is still going on and we're still living as, as we can see just by the nature of this has to be online that the pandemic is still with us and the teachers and leaders have had a heck of a lot else to deal with rather than also trying or find a way to implement the, the new curriculum um, and it's again it's about um, parity uh, with all schools as well where we've seen like obviously some of the pilot schools that um, piloted the curriculum rollout so then it perhaps there wouldn't be a parity with the schools across different areas. So yes, I completely agree um, with that. And on Eston, yes, I think that whilst we are delay, hopefully delaying the, um, or hope we would hope to delay the rollout of the curriculum, I do think it is only fair that we are looking at um, delaying for, for 12 months the, the Eston inspections. And again, like Helen said, it's about perhaps looking at Eston itself as well, about how it um, reports and looked, in, looked into school and reports on schools because that would need to change along with the new curriculum as well. So again, yes to both. Thank you, Stefan. And uh, finally to you, please, Lee. I think these are judgments the incoming education minister are going to have to make once they've taken stock of the situation they inherit. So uh, I'm cautious with prejudging that, frankly, and giving a definitive view. My instinct is that we've already delayed the new curriculum coming in by a year in response to uh, the request. Sorry to interrupt you, Lee, but I can't, I can't hear you very well. Okay. Uh, I'll go back, to, I go back to the start of my answer. Do you hear any of it? We can hear you, Lee. It's just I think people who are listening on the phone are struggling a little bit. You're just coming across a little bit quiet, that's all. Okay, sorry. 
But yeah, so I think this is a judgment that the incoming education minister is going to have to make. They're going to have to take stock of the situation they find themselves facing, and I'm reluctant to prejudge that, uh, to be honest. I can tell you my instinct is, and my instinct is we have already delayed the implementation of the curriculum by a year in response to the request of the profession, and that was the right thing to do. Uh, at some point, we're going to have to start a soft implementation of this. We've had the pioneer schools, they've, they've shown us some way, but we are going to have to uh, have a go at it, really. And I think it's, you know, thinking of the famous quote of my own boss, Rod Davis, this is a process, not an event. Uh, this is going to be a significant change program. It's going to take a number of years to bed in. Uh, and I think we need to make a start of it. Uh, and similarly, I think Estim, you know, we need to get back to normal as soon as we can. Estim will be fully seized on the pressures schools are facing. Uh, and I think uh, a whole year without any external support challenge, uh, dipsticking, if you like, of where schools are based on their improvement plans is uh, not without risks. So, so I, th you know, I think we shouldn't do that. And I think we should make sure that Estim understands, I'm sure they will, this, this pressure schools are under, and it should be a proportionate approach. Thank you very much, Lee. Thank you for, for, for all your comments uh, from all the candidates this evening. Uh, unfortunately, time has run out. I'm sure we, um, we could have spent another hour at least having, uh, having a discussion about the issues uh, relating to education. I would like to really quickly bring in uh, our NAHT Curry President, uh, Karina Hansen, just briefly before we finish, just for any uh, closing remarks before I bring the meeting to a close. Karina? Uh, thank you, Laura. Okay, I, I think it's been really interesting to listen to everything you've had to say. Um, I mean, our manifesto that we've put forward is, is there because that is what uh, our school leaders are fed back to us that they want. You know, the, 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 the pause on curriculum, it, it's needed. We haven't had time. We've been managing crisis for a year. That's what we've been doing. We haven't had time to get to grips with curriculum. Yes, we've had pioneer schools that have been able to do that, but that is not the, the picture in every school and we need it to be equitable. And that's what we're looking for is, is, is something that is equitable for all schools in Wales. Um, another part of that is inspection. I, I, you know, this isn't the time. We're talking about well-being. We're talking about uh, the well-being of leaders and of staff. And without a doubt, it doesn't matter how we dress it up, inspection is going to bring a huge amount of stress and strain to schools. It, and it's not needed at the moment. I, I, and I, I just don't understand, or we don't understand, sorry, the, the, the requirement for it, nor what is it that they're actually going to be inspecting. School improvement plans are based on our recovery. Recovery, we're reporting to our local authorities. If we look at uh, the, the, just the comments around consortia, if you were to talk to most schools across Wales, I think they would say that their local authorities were the support for them, not the consortia. So there are lots and lots of questions that we've got around how things are working at the moment. We're very enthusiastic about curriculum. We, under, we want to push that. We want to work with Welsh Government to develop it, and we're excited about it. We're excited about change. We want to, um, uh, to work alongside you to develop it. But we need you to listen to the profession. You know, we're, we're here and we know what we're doing. You've got a, a dedicated, uh, a passionate uh, leadership out there who will do the right thing. And I think it's time that we're listened to and, and that, that, that you, 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 take, you take on board and you trust, you trust us to do that. Um, and I, I'm just going to take a little bit of issue as well around um, the principle that um, leaders do it for the love of the job. I, I, I don't accept that. I, I think that's not a good enough uh, reason to say that we don't deserve uh, equitable pay in the roles that we do. You would never get that answer in any other profession that that's a good enough reason for not paying people for the role that they do. And this, uh, this whole situation and the, the place that we've been in over this last year has shown 
the enormous role that schools and the school communities uh, they play within their school communities and I think that needs to be um, to be remunerated for, for, for many of our, particularly the sport, small schools, which was the example that was brought up. And I can add to that example, if you had a small school with a, uh, with a, a teacher with a TLR and uh, an Elenco allowance, they would actually be paid more than a head teacher. And that, that to me cannot be right. The responsibility lies with head teachers. It's a huge responsibility. I don't think the answer is um, adding more schools to head teachers and, and uh, uh, you know, federating and uh, making executive heads. I, I, I can see where you're coming from, but that is not the answer. And it's not the answer that we need in this, uh, in the, at this time. So anyway, I'm going to say thank you. And I, I am going to ask again that uh, we've made our, our wishes very clear within our manifesto. Um, and I'm hoping that you will sign up to our pledge and you'll, you'll work with us in the coming year. Thank you. Thanks, Karina. And can I just add uh, once again, my thanks to all the candidates, all our members who have joined us uh, this, this evening. Uh, we really value uh, you taking the time to take part in this event. Um, please, uh, anybody, any candidates amongst you that haven't signed up to the uh, NAHT Cymru Pledge, we urge you to do so via our social media channels uh, at Cymru NAHT or via our Facebook page, NAHT Cymru. Uh, it just leaves me to say uh, good evening to you all. Thank you once again for coming and best of luck with the election to all of you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good evening. Bye. Bye. Bye.